Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Screening for Spiritual Needs. I'm Andrew Andresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are all delighted you could join us. We have well over 430, I think 35, uh, 440 registrants, um, so this is very exciting for us. Uh, some housekeeping instructions off the top. You are listening in using your computer's speaker system by default and are muted. Should you have any technical questions regarding your audio or visual, please type those into the chat box located in the platform's dashboard. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions for our presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane in that same control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will collect these and have a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. We have some promotion slides at the end. Um, I've attached QR codes to those, so if you happen to have a smartphone, you can have that ready. It will be easy just to take a screenshot of that and plug you right into registration. Um, I think Dr. Vichette's going to be talking about a, uh, work, a research work group, and I've also signed that with a QR code. Um, and so with that, I'll turn this over to Dr. George Vichette, Director of Transforming Chaplaincy. Andy, I think we're actually going to turn it over to Nina Riddle, who's uh, okay. our moderator for today. Okay. Um, uh, Nina's um, um, uh, a member of the Transforming Chaplaincy uh, research team and staff chaplain at Bryan Medical Center. Nina, why don't you take it? Absolutely. Thank you, George. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our webinar about screening for spiritual needs. Um, I have the honor of introducing our presenters this morning. Um, First, we have Reverend Jeffrey Pate, um, manager and chaplain at the Department for Spiritual Care at Oshino Baptist Medical Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. Jeff has served as a professional chaplain with Oshino Health for about 12 years and is APC board certified, and he's very, very passionate about the service and the healing chaplains provide to patients, families, and staff. He will be joined in his presentation by his colleague, Teresa Reynolds. Teresa has been in nursing for over 27 years. She's a graduate of Our Lady of Holy Cross College. She acquired her graduate degree from King University in Bristol, Tennessee, and she is currently serving as the nursing director at Oshner Baptist Campus in New Orleans. Um, she has presented widely on healthcare careers at Louisiana State University, um, business fraternity Alpha Kappa Z, and she has been a recipient of the Louisiana Grade 100 Nurses in 2019. Our second presenter after those two wonderful people will be um, the Reverend Dwayne Campbell, who is critical care chaplain in the Department for Pastoral Services at the Christ Hospital Health Network in Cincinnati, Ohio. He's the ICU chaplain at Christ Hospital. He's a professional counselor and an adjunct faculty member at Xavier University, teaching counselors how to integrate spirituality into the counseling setting and um, my dear colleague, George Fajet, who is the professor and the director of research for the Department of Religion, Health and Human Values at Rush University Medical Center and the director of Transforming Chaplaincy. It is a pleasure to be working with all of you and let me hand it over to Jeff and Teresa. Actually, it may be to me, right? Oh, oh I'm so sorry, yes, to George first. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Uh, and thanks to, uh, for everyone for joining us. Uh, we're really excited about this conversation. I'm going to offer th um, a few minutes uh, um, uh, by way of background. The, the topic about screening for um, uh, spiritual screening for patients, inpatients, and outpatients is one around which there has been a bit of research. And so just want to kind of uh, make you aware of some of that research. Um, the, when chaplains are trying to address the question of who's the patient, who should, who are the patients that I should see today? Yes, the, it's interesting to know that um, the, one of the first people to write about that was Russell Dix, who wrote about it in 1940. So some of you will know that in 1940, Russell was part of uh, a, a, a group um, that kind of created what eventually becomes uh, College of Chaplains, the Association of Professional Chaplains. And he wrote the first standards for professional chaplaincy. And in the standards, he has actually a discussion about um, um, how chaplains make decisions about what patients they should see 
and um, uh, here's a quote, you know, you can see it on the slide, the chaplain shall have a rational plan for selecting his um, uh, patients, right? <clears throat> Another person who's written about this is Mark LaRocca Pitts. People will know Mark uh, uh, as a leader in APC and the current uh, secretary of APC's board. And in his essay, Mark kind of reviews, you know, there's different ways of kind of making decisions about what patients we should see today. I should see every new patient or I should kind of make rounds. He calls that case finding, or maybe a better way is to kind of rely on staff to make appropriate referrals and patients to raise their hand and let us know if they need to see patients. Or another approach that Mark talks about is uh, protocol-based systems. Chaplains will see all new codes, all codes, all deaths, whenever patients have major transitions in care. For example, moving uh, to uh, from a regular floor to the ICU. So <clears throat> those are different approaches. Uh, a team from Mercy uh, Hospitals in, in Arkansas, uh, Marson and uh, Alvarez, uh, wrote a really interesting essay in 2019 uh, about developing a priority list and making use of the electronic medical records that'll kind of sort patients who meet certain criteria related to acuity or being on specific units or who have more than average length of stay or who have screened positive for spiritual distress. And they talk about creating a priority list that's based in part on the kind of resources available in the department. So there is an interesting uh, body of uh, research and scholarship about this uh, at the end of the slides. Uh, it'll be too quick to see it today, but uh, you'll be able to download the slides um, uh, after the webinar that we have the bibliography so you can look up these essays. Andy, let's look at the next one. Today we're talking about spiritual screening, which is the first row in this slide. Uh, but just to kind of remind people that spiritual screening um, um, is one of three different approaches to clinical inquiry about spirituality and religion. A more in-depth approach is a kind of spiritual history, and the most in-depth approach is spiritual assessment. But when we talk about spiritual screening, we talk about something that happens at an initial contact with a patient. It's usually very brief. It has a few specific questions. And often the screening can be performed by any trained clinician. It doesn't have to be a spiritual care specialist like a chaplain. And you'll see some models for spiritual screening here. We developed a model here at Rush um, uh, in 2009. Karen Steinhauser's question, are you at peace? Do you have any spiritual pain? Um, uh, and there's a two item screener uh, that was developed by Stephen King and colleagues that we'll see in a second. Andy, let's look at the next one. One of the reasons why we want to screen for spiritual pain, spiritual distress, is actually we have a pretty substantial body of research that indicates that uh, patients who are experiencing religious or spiritual struggle um, have that, that it has harmful effects. It has harmful effects on emotional well-being. It has harmful effects on quality of life. It has harmful effects on spiritual well-being. And it also uh, may increase uh, people's utilization of hospitals. It may uh, reduce their adherence. Uh, so there are important reasons um, uh, that we've seen in the research that it says are really important to identify patients who may be experiencing religious and spiritual struggle. Andy, let's look at the next one. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks. When we get into developing screening questions, we get into the nuts and bolts, actually, of developing good screening questions. And as we've all gone through COVID, we've all realized, okay, you know, you, you want a screening you want to screen for COVID in a way that doesn't have a lot of false negatives. It says, oh, you're healthy, you're fine. And then you go and sneeze on somebody like I am today and you're making everybody sick, right? <clears throat> so the important thing is in the um, in the left-hand column here is, is that you, you want to have a screening um, uh, process that actually um, comes up with true positives, as many true positives as possible and as few, few negatives as possible. Because when you have a few negatives that, that you've kind of, the screener has said, oh, that person's fine. You don't need to prioritize seeing them. And if they're not fine, that's actually the, the real flaw in, 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 the, um, in, in the screening item. So let's look at the next slide, Andy. Stephen King and a, a bunch of other people, Stephen King is at Seattle Care, Cancer Care Alliance. And uh, my colleague, Pat Murphy, and I helped Stephen on this. <clears throat> this was a study of... Um, I think it was 1,400 um, long-term survivors of stem cell transplants, where it's been the most rigorous test, actually, of religious uh, spiritual screening items that's been conducted. Um, the gold standard used here was actually answers to um, the seven questions 
in Ken Pargaman's negative religious coping. And, and of the 1,400 patients, 14% uh, of them appear to have struggle based on that gold standard. And, and here you'll see four different, uh, the rows are four different screening items uh, where we try to kind of test the sensitivity and specificity against the gold standard. So the first item, do you struggle with loss of meaning and joy in your life? <clears throat> do you currently have what you would describe as religious or spiritual struggle? The sensitivity and specificity for that first item, 60%, 65, the second item, 54%, 77. The sensitivity is what's important here, and it's not good enough. It has to be closer to 80. If you use both those items together, it did actually come up to a sensitivity of 82%. So the, the Karen Steinheiser's item about are you at peace by itself, the sensitivity was no really not very good. The rush protocol actually didn't perform very well either. So here's an example actually of a testing sensitivity and specificity and screening items. It suggests that the existing items um, uh, are, are just um, not as good as we'd like them to be, but probably, um, uh, you know, if you have to find a place to start, you could start with uh, some of these or some of the ones that uh, we'll hear about in a minute. Uh, Andy, next slide. <clears throat> As, as I said, actually, you, you know, the existing items are not as good as we, they need to be. So there is a need for future research in this area. And here's just some areas uh, of future research. And I think with that, uh, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you, Andy. I think my next slide is bibliography, right? And so people can look at that later. Um, uh, and, and Jeff, we'd love to hear about the kind of screening uh, uh, work that you guys have done down there at Oxford. Yeah, great. Uh, George, thank you. I'm assuming everyone can hear and see me now. Had a little challenge of that to begin with. Well, hi, as mentioned, my name is Jeff Pate and I'm the manager of spiritual care at Oshner Baptist in New Orleans, Louisiana. We're a campus of Oshner Health, a leader in healthcare and here in the Gulf South. My project was entitled Spiritual Screening, Nurse Chaplain Collaboration. In July, Harvard and Brigham and Women's Hospital published a paper in JAMA highlighting that research shows spirituality should be incorporated into care for both serious illness and overall health. On the team of researchers was Transform Chaplaincy, Transforming Chaplaincy's own Dr. George Fichette. Dr. Fichette, who remained in contact with my team throughout this project of ours, shared with me that one of the most pressing challenges for spiritual care departments is to implement methods to identify patients who want or need spiritual care. Chaplains and nurses across my health system have also felt this need, hence our project. Studies have demonstrated that spiritual care, as George was pointing out earlier, can improve patient experience, enhance employee engagement, and save money. In 2018, I led a performance improvement project where we, and this isn't the project I'm talking on today, this is just to set the stage, where with intentional chaplain rounding, on patients and staff, we saw a nearly seven point jump in top box scores from the previous year's average on that unit. This was the HCAP survey question related to recommending the hospital a nine or a 10 out of a zero to 10 scale. According to our patient experience department, to their knowledge, there was no other performance improvement project on that unit during this time. The quarter we ran the project, the unit also saw the highest HCAP scores in communicating with nurses, responsiveness of hospital staff, treating nurses treating patients with courtesy projects. I spoke with Brent Peary of Memorial Hermann in Houston, to whom I am thankful for his time and experience. They had adapted the Rush Protocol for spiritual screening, and he was my Gulf Coast neighbor. Brent was good about reminding me of the why behind a project like this. And this was what George was talking about to begin with as well. We want those who want or need a chaplain to get one because we know that chaplaincy care makes a difference, that we heal. This is the why behind our work, and it was the why behind our project. Andrew, next slide, please. But there is currently no standardized screening process across our system to assess for spiritual distress in our patients. And our campuses, like many of yours, do not have enough chaplains for them to provide screens on every admitted patient. Without such a resource, patients with highest levels of distress are those who want to see a chaplain, 
may, may be admitted and discharged without receiving the whole person care for which our system is capable. So our project sought to create and utilize a nursing screening tool that assessed a patient's level of spiritual distress or interest in seeing a chaplain and then would trigger a chaplain consult based on those responses. Our goal was to increase the percentage of visits that chaplains made on those who were in spiritual distress and or wanted to see a chaplain by 25%. Next slide, please, Andrew. I don't know if y'all slides, there we go. A voice of customer survey made up of chaplains, nursing leaders, bedside nurses, and the unit secretary found that chaplains needed help triaging patients, that a tool in EPIC, which is our EMR, was most preferred, and that creating a screening process along with education was key. Next slide, please. To assess the performance of our screening tool, we first took a baseline measurement of how we were performing. On the unit this project took place, the chaplain visited 53 patients, simply going door to door. Of those 53 patients, 34 were available for an initial visit. Of those 34 patients, 15 of them were assessed as positive for wanting and needing a chaplain. So 44% of the visits, 44 of visits were on patients wanting or needing a chaplain. Next slide, please. To find the baseline measurement of whether or not the patients we were already visiting wanted or needed a chaplain, we adapted the brief in our COPE tool and the spiritual aim tool. This survey tool was used before and after implementing our screening tool as to validate if the patients the chaplain visited wanted or needed a chaplain. These questions were not asked to the patient. The chaplain used her assessment skills to determine if any of these were applicable. Also, the chaplain asked the patient if there was anything they needed from her. Next slide, please. Before implementing our screening tool, we did a fishbone diagram to assess for root causes around the lack of a systemized approach to spiritual screening. We found that there was no established best practice for spiritual distress screening questions, and nor was there an established process, education, or automation in EPIC for nurses to ask and record appropriate screening questions. Next slide. Next. So what did we do? After much research from Chaplain Becky Goff, who was a main driver of the results on this project and also the lead chaplain for the unit where we performed this project, our team decided to have two screening questions plus one observation only question for the nurse. We knew the timing would not work to get the questions set up in our EMR. So as a pilot, we loaded the questions onto the Microsoft Forms app and placed a desktop link on all the WOW cards, which is what we call our mobile charting cards, and department PCs. Next, nurses were trained in offering the screening. After the nurse loaded the answers to the questions into forms, an email was sent to Chaplain Becky with the results. Becky analyzed the screening results and visited the patients accordingly. Next slide, please. Like the Rush Protocol and adapted Memorial Hermann model, we included an introductory comment for the nurse to share with the patient to help transition during their assessment. We adapted a screening question identified from Stephen King and others article, determining best methods to screen for religious and spiritual distress. That question was, are you currently struggling with the loss of meaning, peace, or joy in your life? And because we wanted to screen for distress and a desire to see a chaplain, we adapted a second question from our CPE director, Megan Alamon, who had previously used it in the VA system. And that question was, while you are here, do you have any spiritual, religious, or cultural requests or concerns you want your care team to be aware of during your admission? Next slide, please. The observation only question was a unique and important addition of Chaplain Becky's who also wanted to engage the nurse's intuition and observations. Next slide, please. Now to the exciting results. 
While using the screening tool, there were 57 patients that were indicated as wanting or needing a chaplain. Out of those 57 patients, Becky was able to visit 40 of them. The discrepancy was due to discharge or scheduling conflicts. Out of the 40 visited, 35 of them were confirmed as wanting or needing a chaplain based on the survey tool I showed previously. That means that through implementing a screening process, chaplains went from 44% of their visits being with patients who wanted or needed a chaplain to 88%. That is a 100% increase, which is 75% greater than what our initial goal was. Also, nurses who participated in the project reported feeling more engaged with their patients, improved patient experience, improved collaboration between chaplaincy and nursing, and that the questions were easy and quick to use. They also added that for the process to remain sustainable, the questions will need to be added as ret docs within EPIC, meaning that the questions need to become required documentation. In other words, our project was an overwhelming success. Remember the quote I mentioned from George in the opening? I quoted him as saying, one of the most pressing challenges for spiritual care departments is to implement methods to identify patients who want or need spiritual care. Well, he went on to say this, you and your colleagues have developed an effective response to the challenge. Chaplains across the country will welcome learning about this important initiative. My team and I are grateful and humbled by this, and we do hope that you learned something today. So where do we go from here? We know the screening process was effective. And while the use of Microsoft Forms was an innovative approach for the project, for long-term sustainability, the nurses observed that the tool needs to be built into Epic as a rec doc with the screening occurring during or around admit intake. And we have already started exploring with Epic's clinical documentation team, my CNO, and the Interdisciplinary Spiritual Care Integration Council to roll out this into EPIC. We know there is both a need and a desire for such a tool. Last year, I foreshadowed this project to my Health System CNO Council, and there was high enthusiasm for it. Well, it is an honor to share some of our learnings with you today, and I look forward to learning with you and from you as well. This could not have happened without my project sponsor, Donna Martin, nursing leaders, Teresa Reynolds, who you hear from in a moment, Lauren Cooper, and the staff of the Med Surge Unit where we participated this, participated in this. My Lean Greenbelt Project coach, my team of chaplains at Oshner Baptist and across the Oshner system, and finally Chaplain Becky Golf, who was a primary engine and innovator behind this project. Well, thank you all for being with us today and listening to this. Uh, with that, I will turn things over to Teresa Reynolds, the nursing director for the unit the project was performed on. Uh, she was an immediate supporter of this work, and she will share more about how chaplains can collaborate with nursing to lay a foundation for such projects. Thank you, Jeff. Nice job. Um, we can go ahead and move off the off the, the screenshot. We can get off the headshot. There we go. So um, as we talk about chaplaincy and nursing collaboration, um, my hope is that if you're seeking any kind of information on how to grow it at your facility or system level, I can share a little bit of knowledge with you of what we did here at Ashna Baptist. And um, hopefully we can give you some little nuggets to take away on how to implement the process and you'll grow it at your facility. You know, um, here, I think our biggest asset was education. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, and then we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, when we talk about education, and I guess all of us have a little bit of a kid in us, um, the best way to get things going and get moving is just to quit talking and get doing it, right? That's what Walt Disney said, and look what he developed. So hopefully we can develop the chaplaincy program at the same um, massive size as Disney. Um, so with education, we just felt like it was super important here at Ashna Baptist to introduce our staff to it right away. Because um, as we were talking to all the new nurses you see in med surge, which usually are your baby new grad nurses, um, you know, they really aren't familiar with the chaplaincy program. They're not even aware really much of what it has to offer. 
not only to our patients, but to the staff as well. Uh, I personally found out when I was asked to be involved in an interview uh, with the chaplain program um, in a position here at Ashra Baptist, and I was amazed. I truly had such a learning curve there to find out what was involved with acquiring um, your chaplaincy and becoming a chaplain and the studies and the hours involved in the projects. It was amazing to me. And I just, you know, not that I thought I knew it all, but I was like, wow, if I had no clue, who else doesn't know what's involved with it or what it's about? So I was super excited to collaborate and move forward with this project. And some of the ways that we started here at Baptist with educating our staff was through what we call Nurses Rock. So when we get a new hire in, all of our nurses have to attend basically a facility orientation. During that time, Jeff is allowed an hour to come up and he presents who he is, what he represents, what his team is about, and how they service the facility, the patients. And it's a great intro to the staff. So they know we have it here because not all facilities are fortunate enough to have a chaplain program. And so we start that process off by a slow roll of just introducing Jeff and his team and what it's about here at Baptist. Um, we have our chaplains actively round on the unit. So day in and day out, they are involved with my staff on the unit. They're looking at our sheets, seeing our admissions, um, specifically to center where we piloted this program. They were very active, but they're active throughout our facility. They're visible, which is great. You need to be visible and out mingling with your staff. You need to establish that connection, that rapport, that baseline, and build trust. Um, and then as we extended the services with the pilot on center, they also started um, talking about what was going on with COVID right before it, right? So it was a perfect segue into this because the need was there. The need was there not only for the patients, but for the staff. And so we found with the visibility of the chaplains on the unit, the staff was actually utilizing the services of the chaplains. So they started to have a familiarity to it that was very personal. So they could speak to it on the unit with the patients, physicians, other coworkers, the family members of the patients. So it really started to take a life of its own um, through their presence, their daily presence. And then- Teresa, I don't also... want to cut you off. I don't want to cut you off, but we're going to have to ask you to move quickly through your slides so we have time okay. for our next presenter. Okay, so the education was not only unit department, you know, facility, we went facility wide. So facility wide, they round, they do tea for the soul throughout the hospital. We have a serenity room that was created. Um, and we felt that this just really helped the staff embrace it and want to collaborate and want to learn more. We have morning huddle where all the system leaders are on at 8 a.m. So you can go to the next slide past unit and go to facility, please. And you can um, get a touch for what's happening in the hospital. So if there are any patient demise in the hospital, it's announced in the morning to the chaplains know immediately where to go. If there's an issue with staff, we deal with our own grievances and our own angst. They're aware and alerted during that time as well. So they can immediately be deployed and go touch out to the staffing units. If there was a family or a patient death or a staff member who and, you know, had to be involved with something like this as well. So it really grew from the unit that we did the survey on to the throughout the facility. And um, we utilize these morning huddles and their rounding to come up and get it throughout the hospital so they can be have great touch points with the chaplains. Our biggest area where we probably can grow even further to give a voice to the chaplains is at our leadership huddles. Our facility is large, everyone's facility size is different and their healthcare system is different. But we do have quarterly leadership meetings throughout the system uh, here for Ashram at the convention center, which is huge. And so I feel like there's an area to grow and give opportunity to a platform so chaplains can get up there and present what they're doing, great feedback and information from conferences like this to share and give us visions and goals down the road. Um, so, I mean, it's just taking it from the small and then enhancing it and bringing it throughout your units and your facility. And we just really embrace it down here and have truly enjoyed Jeff and his team. That's it. Thanks so much, Teresa. Uh -huh. We're ready to turn it over to Dwayne. All right, thank you, George. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to share uh, the journey that we have gone on here at Christ Hospital. As our journey began back in uh, 2009, and uh, Andrew, you can go on to the next slide. 
began in 2009 when our hospital made the decision to transition from paper charting to the electronic medical records. Simultaneously, we were asked to look at our patient satisfaction scores. So the question for us became, how can we use this new EMR to better address the spiritual needs of our patients? At that time, our spiritual assessment process consisted of the bedside nurse asking one question of the patient, do you want to see a chaplain? This question may, may or may not have been asked, and if so, the answer didn't guarantee a call to pastoral services for a chaplain to come and follow up. As we began the process, both nurses and chaplains found this single screening question to be ineffective to supply enough meaningful information to the chaplain so they could understand and address and prioritize the spiritual needs of the individual. Since we were transitioning to the EMR, why not identify some questions we thought that would better help us understand the person in the bed from a, a spiritual perspective? We did a literature research and found really no spiritual screening tool that fit our criteria, nor did we find an effective process of how to get a spiritual screen performed on a patient in a timely and a consistent manner. manner, uh, manner. And even if we did, how were these results going to be shared with the chaplain? So with that, uh, our organization, we, we first started by, by organizing a spiritual research and development committee. This committee consisted of chaplains, nurses, doctors, a member of the newly formed IT team, and a member from our family and advisory council. This committee was tasked with three goals. First thing, we wanted to create a standardized electronic evidence-based screening tool to be housed in the EMR for the spiritual screening of our patients. The second was to create an electronic screening process to be used by the nurses to automatically generate referrals for chaplains at the time of the admission of the patient. And then thirdly, we wanted to increase the overall number of patients receiving chaplain referrals, uh, thus beginning to address the spiritual needs of our patient population in a more timely fashion. We believe here at Christ we have a unique culture that pastoral services is a vital part of the transdisciplinary team. Identifying the spiritual need is a key component in the healing overall healing process for the patient. So at this point, we asked the nurses, weigh in, tell us what you want from us. They said, well, whatever you do, we want this tool and process to be quick and easy. Their thought, if the screening questions are going to be asked upon the admission of the patient, we need to put this into our admission navigator, which is already approximately an hour uh, of questions. Adding these questions can't take too much more time and the process of conveying that information discovered from the patients to the chaplains, it has to be a simple process. So we set out first to address the uh, issue of creating uh, of the spiritual screening tool. As we looked at this process, what was important to us was for us to discover what our patients thought was most important for us to know about them spiritually. So with the help of the Spiritual Research and Development Committee, we identified 10 questions from the literature on spiritual histories and spiritual assessments that was already out there that we would present to our patients. We gathered nurse volunteers and we wanted the nurse volunteer, uh, nurses to ask these questions since it was going to be nurses that were going to be doing the screening. Uh, they went out, they asked 101 patients which questions best reflected their spiritual beliefs and which questions were most meaningful to them. The patient population that we interviewed, 63% of them were female, 37% uh, identified as male, 50% were Protestant. What, what we found very interesting was 27% had no religious affiliation or faith background. 20% uh, were Catholic and 3% were Jewish. And once these responses were received, the Spiritual Research and Development Committee took those questions and fashioned them at, to, at the request of the nurses so that the responses would be a simple yes or a no. With their responses, what we discovered from our patients that was that they wanted us to know that how important their spiritual and religious beliefs were to them in coping with illness and in crisis situations. They wanted us to know what their daily spiritual practices were and how we could help them to stay connected to those practices while they were here in the hospital. And then thirdly, they uh, wanted us to be, or they wanted to have the ability to communicate to us what was, if they had a spiritual need or an emotional need during their stay at the hospital. 
So with this, we came up with the following three questions. And then as the committee, we added one more question uh, to the process. The first question that the research yielded was, do your spiritual, religious, cultural beliefs act as a source of comfort and strength and help you cope with crisis? The second, do you have any spiritual, religious, cultural practices or customs that can better help us take care of you? The third, do you have any spiritual, religious, cultural requests or concerns at this time that we can help you with? And then the committee came up with the fourth, fourth question because we know how important community is to individuals who are spiritual. So we asked them the question, do you want us uh, or would you like us to contact your clergy? So with that, well, while we were developing it, the, uh, and uh, Andrew, if you would go back to, um, that was, that's the one. So while developing question two, if there were spiritual uh, sources, uh, resources or practices that the patients had, we wanted to know what they were. And not only did we want to know, but we wanted the nurses to know as well what those practices were because the spiritual care of the patient doesn't need to be relegated just to the chaplains. We wanted the nurses to engage in the spiritual aspect as well. So two of the questions that they could work on immediately would be if the patient wanted gender care, where they wanted a female taking care of a female or male taking care of a male, or if there were dietary restrictions. And with a, a Jewish population and a Muslim population that we have here, there are kosher items that are on our menu from our uh, cafeteria that can be taken to our uh, patients that ha do have dietary restrictions. We wanted to know if prayer was important to them, their faith practices, if they uh, read scriptures or if they had sacred readings, if they had specific times during the day that they would pray, that we could incorporate that into the treatment plan for the patient. Really wanted to get a good understanding of who this person was from a spiritual perspective that was coming to us. The sacraments, though it was connected more to the Catholic patients, there are the, the sacraments for our Protestant patients that they want as well. But we also recognize that there are some nurses out there that don't understand spiritual language. So we put in one more piece that says other so that they could put in if the patient wanted communion, if they wanted to be baptized, uh, if they wanted last rites, uh, the anointing or the sacrament of the sick, whatever it might be, and that could be shot to us. The, the next uh, drop down question was for the uh, one that we inserted, if they wanted us to contact their clergy, their priest, their imam, uh, their rabbi, or their, their pastor. Uh, with that, we wanted to know what synagogue or what church do you go to? And then secondly, if they knew a person's name, we wanted to make sure that that name uh, was put into the system so we as chaplains could make a good uh, informed call. Then the, the final step that the committee decided was, we all know that things happen while a patient is in the hospital. How can we reassess the patient on a consistent basis to find out if there is a need that has risen for a chaplain? So we put in a 24-hour rescreening question that asks, do you have any spiritual, religious, or cultural needs at this time? This really was very helpful because patients would get new diagnoses, loved ones outside of the hospital. We, we found this very helpful during the time of COVID when nobody could come into the hospital, that the patients could had a way to communicate to us, we need somebody to come here to help us to process some of the events that have taken place, not only to us, but have also taken place in our family outside of here. What we did with these questions was, with the, the answers to question two, three, and four, that answer generated an automatic consult to the pastoral services department. We, when we did that, we, we chose not to do question one because our department is limited. Our hospital is a 550 bed hospital, but the chaplain resources that we have, we, we are uh, not too well populated in the, the chaplain field. So we didn't want to overindulge ourselves with too many consults. So we just decided to go with quest the answers to question two, three, and four. Those would generate an automatic uh, consult to us. We implemented this tool and the results that we found were just uh, incredible. Uh, just recently, I did an audit of uh, how many times these, uh, this tool is being asked of our patients. 
And incredibly, 83% of our patient population is receiving this tool. Most days we have about 350 patients that are in-house. So 83% of them are being asked the question, the, the spiritual screening questions. Uh, our goal was 100%, but recognizing in the critical care areas, not everybody's able to uh, respond. Our labor and delivery, about 50% of our patients are screened. And also our behavioral health unit, very few of our patients are, are, are screened at that time as well. So finally, we looked and saw the success of this. So uh, Andrew, if you will go on to the next one, the key components to the success of the development of this tool and the easy implementation into the admission process. One was based on the long-term collaboration that we had with the interdisciplinary team, especially with nursing. The second, we felt like we identified the correct questions to ask to our patient population because it was generated from our patients to us, them telling us what they wanted. Working with our IT department during the build and as we have grown uh, over the years, uh, future rebuilds and future endeavors that, that we're still looking at has been helpful in the success of this. Our nurse educators are the ones that will break down the tool to our staff uh, as we have so much turnover going on. And especially when we've had all these uh, external agency nurses coming in, all of them are still asking these questions of our patients. And we couldn't do what we have done without the adoption of these innovations by our nurses. The impact that this has had on our consults was just incredible, blew our minds. We started out in 2011 and we saw that we had 1,300 uh, consults that were given to our department. Over the next eight years, we saw those results go from uh, 1,300 to over 10,000 consults that came to our department the year right before the pandemic stru struck. And what we attributed this to is in 2013, 2014, after three years of asking these questions to the patients, the nurses vicariously became aware of everything that we were doing and all that we had to offer. The communication that was being provided by uh, the, the pastoral staff and everything, uh, the, the wide variety of conversations that we would have with patients. So during the, you'll see a jump from the year 2013 to 2014. That was a time that our heart failure unit connected with us and said, would you come and would you do some advanced care planning discussions with us? Now, if you look and you say, how does that deal with the spiritual and covering the spiritual aspect of patients? Well, what we found out that with the patients that come in in CHF, what our, our numbers have shown is that 28% of them answered yes to the first question, which would not generate an automatic consult to us. Only 8% uh, were tripped by our spiritual screening scale, but phenomenally 38% that said no to the screening process, all four of the screening process, we discovered that they re either requested prayer or there were spiritual needs that were missed in the spiritual screening process for them. So over 66, two thirds of the patients that we had missed in the initial screening process, we started this capture in this process. So it was something that was just, it was overwhelming to see everything that had taken place. Um, and it's, it's hard to believe we have two full-time chaplains, two part-time chaplains, a, a half-time priest that is here. But we, we couldn't have done this. We have a very vibrant volunteer program that we, we take time to uh, extensively train our volunteers as they're going in to meet patients. We also have a clinical pastoral education program here, and they come alongside and provide a, a lion's share of, of the load in, in working with our patient population. So it has been something that we were very glad that we went ahead and did. Uh, we're looking at... Uh, doing some more things in the future, but uh, just appreciate how, uh, what took place, what, what, what happened just 11 years prior, and now the vibrancy of making sure that we have met uh, or are addressing the spiritual needs as they come into the hospital. So thank you for the opportunity to present this to you today. Wonderful. Thank you, Duane, Jeffrey, Teresa. Wonderful presentations. Um, I think we have a few minutes for question and answers. So let me um, pop up that box. Here we go. Um, 
Dwayne, I actually have um, two very interesting questions here for you from our audience to your spiritual screening tool. Um, did you, with your screening tool, actually also have a look at uh, Jehovah's Witness population with regards to the second screening question? Uh, our second screening question in uh, encompasses the Jehovah's Witness population. When we did the initial work, uh, there were no Jehovah's Witness in the building, in the facility at that time, so they were left out, but they all received the spiritual screening uh, uh, as they come into the hospital, and we are able to connect with our Jehovah's Witness liaisons uh, that are affiliated with our hospital to bring them in to provide specific care for the patients that are here at the hospital. Wonderful, thank you. And actually a second question just for clarification also for you, Duane. Um, someone was wondering uh, whether um, you actually screened on labor and delivery or was it a mother baby unit? Or do you have a differentiation for that just as general women's health? Right, it's, it's general women's health. We do have the process into the admission navigator there. Uh, it is up to the discretion of the nurses. Our nurses, they are very bright and very creative, and many of them have learned how to bypass hard stops. <laughs> so with that, uh, we are going to look again at how can we get those individuals in our women's health unit to have these screens done on a consistent basis as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there was one question earlier on that I would uh, want to see whether all of you want to briefly comment on. A very, very interesting comment on, oops, now it's ex escaping my screen. Um, have any of you, um, as we are all aware as chaplains, there is spiritual distress and then this can go further into the field of clinical depression. As you're looking at your screening tools, have you found anything there to kind of carefully incorporate or see um, when it is appropriate um, for your teams to make referrals? Do you do this internally um, or have you thought a little step further with your screening tools um, whether there would be anything to build in there, think about um, on that differentiation so that the right kind of referrals go from pastoral care to the mental health area. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump, I'll jump into that. that. That's a great question. And I, what I can say about that a little bit is that our team was very aware that at times uh, deeper, deeper emotional and behavioral and mental health challenges can um, Run can run parallel with spiritual distress, uh, and we were aware of that. And um, depression was one of the indicators for a nurse if she saw something like that to to you know to trigger a chaplain consult. Well, it's on the list of nurse observations. Um, but that was more not because we saw ourselves as capable of treating clinical depression, but because it can run parallel to spiritual distress. And so uh, supporting a patient yet insofar as it's within our bounds to do. Um, and then also definitely uh, reinforcing to our team the importance of making those referrals. Uh, and that is, that's a, that's a great point. And we do need to, um, to have that collaboration with, with our behavioral health team. Um, usually for us, what that looks like is mentioning it to either the provider or the nurse, and then they go ahead and place that consult in for psych. And what we have done at, at Christ is in our advanced care planning discussions, we screen the patients that are here for heart failure uh, with the personal health questionnaire. It's a nine question questionnaire on uh, depression. And if that patient triggers uh, that depression scale, then we have a system that we will send it to. Um, uh, we'll send it to our coordinators who will then send it to the PCP of the patient. And then our PCPs, all the PCPs have uh, free mental health service uh, provided in their department. They will follow up on that. And we used to uh, send it to our uh, social work department, but through the pandemic, our social work department, as everybody's took a, a big hit and the caseload for them was too big. But 
uh, specifically for our CHF patients, we do a, a, uh, a spiritual, excuse me, a, a depression screen on those patients. Wonderful. Um, another question to all of you. Um, clearly, your screening tools were developed probably primarily with um, adult population in mind. Have you had a chance to think about how those questions, uh, if applicable, would um, go if you have such a unit in your pediatric area? I'll jump on that one. Um, from a nursing perspective, um, you know, Austin is huge and we do have pediatric units within certain facilities. We don't have one here, but I would say you would probably have to be guided by the same question with the adult present, depending on the age, right, of the pediatric age. Some are able to answer and understand more appropriately than others. But I would say, again, that would be through great collaboration of your physician, you know, your team on the um, patient care team with your nurse, your uh, screening tools usually with admission do have some type of screening tool. That's a hard stop as Dwayne said, most of them can jump over them, but it does ask certain questions um, about feeling like you're harmed or safe, uh, any uh, suicidal thoughts or whatnot that are in that front assessment. However, things can change through the process of a hospital course, right? With diagnoses and things you're coming in and being treated with. So um, I would think that you would have to follow your guidelines of HIPAA, uh, knowing the ages of who can answer and who can't for a patient, and then collaborating with your healthcare team. Thanks, Teresa. Nina, let me jump in on this one as well, actually. So <clears throat> the, the question about uh, uh, extending the spiritual screening process into pediatrics is a great question. It's actually one of the areas of research that we need to develop. Same is true for um, uh, spiritual screening for patients with cognitive impairment and, and other mm -hmm. kinds of specialized units, behavioral health units. We really don't have good research-based approaches to spiritual screening in those specialized populations. Um, in a minute, we're going to announce the formation of a transforming chaplaincy work group on developing spiritual screening uh, to take the research further. Um, we're going to have our first meeting um, uh, in about a month, and we're going to invite everyone who wants to kind of come and share best practices and brainstorm with us about how to um, um, work together to develop uh, spiritual screening uh, in a lot of different contexts to kind of come and help us do that. Let me just quickly say that the RUSH screening protocol um, was used in an adolescent transgender clinic, and there has been a paper published by that by Daniel Grossome. And if people uh, would like to kind of get the reference for that paper, you could use PubMed, put Daniel Grossome's name in there, or if you're having trouble with that, send us an email, and, and we'd be glad to help you find that paper. So there's limited research uh, in a kind of special adolescent population. Uh, and lots more research that we need to do. And we look forward on working on that research with people. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And George, if you allow me to tag on, obviously Transforming Chaplaincy also has the Pediatric Research Network. Um, and I know that the conveners of that network, uh, especially Kate Michelle de Jardin, is very, very interested in looking into that research as well. So I do think we have a good number of colleagues across the nation that are certainly recognizing that within the pediatric population, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And maybe there is a cooperation that this group and the Pediatric Research Network can, can work on eventually. Good. I want to carefully say that brings us to the end of the time that we have for our questions. Um, we will make sure that the few questions we were not able to answer right now, we will still answer here within the box and get back to you. Um, but... First and foremost, please let me thank all of our presenters, um, George, Teresa, Jeff, Dwayne, wonderful presentations. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for being here. And first and foremost, thank you so much for developing your tools, sharing those with us, um, showing how they worked and, and making such a tremendous impact um, on your healthcare systems, for our staff, for our patients. Um, I can just say from my perspective, 
having worked in that field for a while as well, this makes all the difference so that our chaplains can work effectively with all of our patient and staff population and that we can really grow um, this important profession. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And Nina, did I cut you off there? Yeah. Nope. I'm sorry. You're good. Yeah, we we just uh, I, let me add my thanks to every uh, to what Nina has said for uh, the great work uh, from our colleagues at Oxner and the Christ Hospital Network. Um, um, and we really uh, look forward to carrying on this conversation. So please join us on November 30th. It'll be the first of uh, multiple meetings of this new work group. If you can't make that meeting, just uh, be sure to send us your email so that we can stay in touch with you. And let me tell you about a few additional things Transforming Chaplaincy is doing. Uh, we have a webinar uh, in, in about 10 days, um, uh, Betwixt and Between, the Unique Role of Chaplains in Promoting Patient-Centered care and medical decision making that will be featuring a conversation uh, with a psychiatrist and research colleague, uh, Robert Klitzman from uh, Columbia University. We're looking forward to that conversation. And after that, we have um, um, best practices in telesupervision um, uh, during the pandemic. Um, uh, a lot of CPE programs uh, turn to virtual uh, CPE and uh, we're going to have um, a webinar that will uh, look at what we've learned uh, from doing virtual supervision. Andy, what's next? Anything? Yeah, so just to remind people that Transforming Chaplaincy does have online research literacy. Uh, our five-week intro to research literacy, the next class will begin in January, and our 10-week um, deeper dive into research literacy our next class uh, will begin in April. And is that it, Andy? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And actually, just to say, um, our, our next Transforming Chaplaincy newsletter will be out um, um, in, in about 10 days, but um, probably on Monday, we're going to send people an announcement that the um, next cohort for the Transforming Chaplaincy Certificate in Spiritual Care Management Leadership will begin in mid-January and run for nine months. Uh, and, and so the details about um, uh, participating in the Certificate in Transforming uh, Spiritual Care Management Leadership will be out next week, and uh, we welcome you to join us for that. Um, I thank you all again for, for joining us today. I, people have asked in the question box whether or not the, you know, the um, uh, slides will be available and uh, the recording of today's presentation uh, with a link to the slides will be sent to everyone probably by Monday um, and, and so uh, you'll have that available uh, um, as a resource uh, for your continued work. Thanks again everyone. I um, uh, hope you all have a good day. We look forward to being with you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you everybody.